our day and age, like Robert said, every single day we need a fresh, we need a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit to help us. I just appreciate God and all that He's done. We talked about raising over $850 in our car wash yesterday, which is a phenomenal feat. We have now raised somewhere around $3,000 to send our kids to youth camp this year. And with all the sponsors, with all the hard work, dedication of the kids and the parents and the leadership team here at Gospel Lighthouse has done, it's just been, it's just been nothing short of phenomenal. So we're looking to send somewhere around 20 to 25 people, that's with staff, to youth camp this year. And that's that's going to be an awesome representation yes. for Gospel Lighthouse. So can you give yourselves a hand this morning for all that you've done? <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many knows we need to we need to uh, we need to do what we can to get our kids in the presence of God as much Amen. as we can. Many young people have been called to camp or called to the ministry through camp and God has touched their heart and their life and their souls and there's many that are preachers, ministers of the gospel out there today as a result of a few days at youth camp around an old fashioned altar and God touched their heart and called them to the ministry. How many knows we need more, more ministers and we need more pastors and praise and worship leaders and missionaries and and, and people to fulfill and to continue the work and the call of the ministry. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, bear with me today because my throat is not cooperating. <laughs> and so uh, I may drink a little more than what I usually do. But uh, nevertheless, turn to Mark chapter number 5. I kept wanting to preach out of Mark on Wednesday night. For those of you who were here, didn't that Sister Nelly? Yeah. <laughs> so God brought me back to some series of passages. And uh, we're going to be in Mark 5, and we're going to stay planted there. So just hold your place there today. And we're going to expose it out. And we're going to go from 1, clear down to uh, verse 20. But our main text this morning will be verse number 6. So Mark chapter number 5, verse number 6. If you have it, say amen. 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 But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshiped him. The title of my message this morning is From Maniac to Messenger. From Maniac to Messenger. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the presence that we feel here in this place. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit, for filling up our cup this morning, for it runneth over. You've already started the work in our hearts and lives here today. Lord, you who began a good work, completed unto the day of Jesus Christ. I thank you for Gospel Lighthouse and our people here today. We are part of the family of God. We love one another. We care and bear each and others, others burdens. This is a family oriented church. And we thank you for what you're doing here and what you're going to do today. Lord, as the kids made their way to the basement this morning, I pray that you would have your way with them. Continue to speak to them, Lord. For your word said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. We are called to come like children, so Lord, I pray today, may we have that same spirit 
that those kids that went to our basement this morning would have, and we'd be open to hear what the Spirit says unto the church today. In Jesus' holy name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Say that title with me this morning, From Maniac to Messenger. <coughs> From Maniac to Messenger. Now, obviously, we're talking about, and most of you have read Mark chapter number 5 before, dealing with the demoniac. And somebody once said that Jesus is seldom early and he's never late. And I promise you this morning, he's never early and he's never late. Jesus always shows up right on time. Doesn't Jesus always show up right in the middle of our circumstances exactly when we need him to show up? And so this man here is in a situation where he is all to himself. And you know, he's in a place of isolation. And we're going to find out that he has made his residence in the place of the tombs. He has made his residence in the place of a graveyard. Now, how many knows you're pretty lonely when you're laying up in a graveyard somewhere oh, yeah. and you made that your home? Uh, yeah. And so we find that this individual has been abandoned probably by his own family and by his own society around him and all the people, his friends and others. But God shows up. Jesus manifests in the flesh, shows up right on time to deliver this man of his situation. And I don't know what you're here this morning dealing with, and you may not be possessed by no devils, but you may be dealing with some trials and situations, and I can guarantee you that God can show up right in the middle of your circumstance and deliver you of whatever you need this morning. He is our deliverer. He is our healer. He is the great I am. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's whatever we need. He is our ever-present help in time of need. Somebody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. So we see that Jesus shows up. Right on time. The Bible says in, John, in Mark chapter number 5, verse 1, And they came over to the other side of the sea. Now who are they talking? Who's they? We're talking about the disciples. The disciples showed up with Jesus. They went over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Now, we know that Gadara is one of ten cities of Decapolis. So he showed up in this little bitty old city to deal with one man's issue. He showed up in a place that really probably nobody else would have gone to. Can you think about a revival going on? Because he just left Capernaum. He just left the Megaplex. He just left the place where he was ministering to the multitudes. And can you imagine an individual saying, you know what, we've got thousands of people showing up to a revival and then shut the whole entire revival down and then go into a place called Gadara to minister to one individual. But that's exactly what Jesus does. That's exa exactly what Jesus is doing right now in this church is he's dealing with each one of us because he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. So as Jesus can show up and deal with my situation, he can show up and deal with your situation, he can be everywhere and anywhere he wants to be at all times. Amen? Don't you thank God that you serve a God that is anywhere and everywhere when you need him? And not just, you don't have to stand in line, you don't have to wait on him and, and whenever you need something, you don't have to wait on him when you have a sickness, you don't have to wait on him when you're dealing through something, you just call upon the name of the Lord. He's there at that present time. So that's where this man was. So I believe, though the Bible does not specifically, and I don't like to, you know, I don't like to read into passages of scripture. It's called Ice and Jesus. I don't like to read into it. But I have to imagine that this man was crying out for God was crying out for deliverance, was crying out for healing, wanted to hear something from somebody, something positive. Is there any hope for me anymore? Yes. And we know nothing about this man. We know nothing about his background. We don't know where he's from. Where he's from. We don't know what his family was like. We don't know if he had any friends. All we know is that he's up and has made his residence in the tombs. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that's a messed up situation. Yeah. I don't have too many friends who live up in a graveyard, and if you do, you need some new friends, amen? But I'm telling you right now, this man was dealing with some stuff. And he found his peace up in a graveyard. And somebody said, why did he make his residence up in a graveyard? Well, I can tell you one thing about graveyards, they're very peaceful. Uh, headstones don't talk back to you. No, they don't. 
And if they do, you better run quickly. So he was looking for a place of solitude. He was looking for a place of peace. He was looking for a place where nobody was talking back to him in a situation. So he finds himself in, in verse number two as we go along here. It says, and when he went out of the ship, this being Jesus, immediately there was a man who met him out of the tombs. A man with an unclean spirit. He didn't say he procrastinated. It doesn't even tell us. The Bible doesn't even say how he knew this man that was filled with these unclean spirits, which we know were, were anywhere between, was a legion of devils, which is anywhere between 1,000 and 6,000 devils that this man was filled with. But we don't even know how he knew that Jesus was coming. But all he knew was, is when Jesus showed up, he wanted to be right there. He wanted to be right in the midst of this situation. So the Bible says, immediately he met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Man with an unclean spirit. Now we're not talking about this guy needing to scrub down with lava soap. This man was dirty on the outside. He was dirty on the inside. He had issues that was going on and he needed those issues dealt with. You know, we can, we can look real good, and we can look real purdy, and we can look at real dressed up on the outside, and we can look real great. And you know what? There's a whole lot of stuff going on on the inside. Yes. Yes, there is. So we've got to be careful. We can dress up the outward appearance, but it's the inward man and the inward parts and the inward heart that God is wanting to try to get to. And so that's where this man was in verse number three as we move along. It says, who had his dwelling. Okay. Which just reiterates what I said. He lived there. He didn't show up once a week. He didn't show up twice a week. This man's dwelling was there. He lived amongst the tombs. And I want to reiterate right here and say the wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he showed up in a situation and stayed amongst the tombs because it was a place of death. It was a place where he was at. It was a place that he could relate to. It was a place that I think that even these devils were trying to bring him into a place of suicide to kill himself. So why not just make yourself right at home, right where the devil wants you? That's where he was. So who had his dwelling amongst the tombs? And the Bible said, and no man could bind him. No, not with changes. Now we don't know anything about his background. We don't know anything about what he was dealing with. We don't know what he was dabbling in. We don't know what type of, type of books he was reading. We don't know what type of movies he was watching. We don't know what type of things he was entertaining in his life. And can I tell you this morning, we need to be careful what we're entertaining. Amen. We need to be careful about the things that we're entertaining in our life. Because I'm telling you, whether it be the, through the tube, whether it be through a cell phone, whether it be through whatever the case may be, those spirits can enter into your, your spirit. And I'm telling you right now, you will be an unclean individual if you allow these things to continue to manifest in your life. And so that's where this man was. Verse number four. Because that he had been often bound with feathers and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder, King James Version, by him. And the fetters broken into pieces, neither could no man tame him. Now that word plucked there, and the chains had been plucked asunder. This man is what I would refer to as a modern day Samson. I mean, this guy, can you imagine just taking chains and being able to rip them off anytime you wanted to? I know all, about, all the men in the place would really like to impress your spouse or impress your you know, girlfriend or significant other today. If we could just do that sort of thing. But this guy literally was so bound up by the devil, and the devil had such a stronghold. How many knows the enemy has some power too? How many knows the devil has some power this morning? We, we know that the enemy has power, but we serve a God who has all power, okay? So this man was bound up by some chains, all right? And so he would break them. He would pluck them asunder. And so he would just literally tear them off, Sister Munson, like dental floss. He would just rip them apart as if there was just nothing unto him. And he threw them into pieces. Neither could no man tame him. Significant word. Because that's where we get the word zookeeper from. No man can tame him. So this man was literally like a wild animal. 
He was just going about through life. He was just trying to find his way. And you know what? He wasn't just like a wild animal, but tre people treated him like that as well. So this man was in a situation where he desperately needed God to show up in his circumstance and touch his situation. So we're moving along in verse number 5. And the Bible says, and always. How many knows what always means? Always means always, right? All the time. Always don't mean a couple. Always means always. Night and day. That's how we know what always means. So he was in the mountains. And he was in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. He was crying out, cutting himself with stones. You know, young people, some of our young people this today, and, and some of the adults, there, there is a new fad that has kind of come into our culture. It's called cutting. Cutting themselves. And, and, and just to try to get rid of the, 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 the mental agony and the mental pain that they're going through. They will cut themselves with various items and things like that just to alleviate the stress and the pressures and the pains of this world. And so cutting is nothing new because it's in Mark chapter number 4, verse number 5, and the first person to cut himself was the demoniac. And that's how you can tell whether or not a spirit is being manifest in our day and age. And the devil is looking to try to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that I might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we have to pray continually for ourselves and pray for our young people because the devil is looking to try to take them out like they tried to, he tried to take this man out. And so he was cutting himself with stones and crying out, basically saying, there's got to be more to life than this. There has to be more to life. Have you ever just said that? There's got to be more to life than what I'm dealing with right now. I can't take any more pressure. I can't take any more struggles. I can't take any more pain. I can't take any more of this. There's got to be more to life than what I'm dealing with right now. And so this man, to try to alleviate some of the pressure, he was cutting himself with stones. Verse number six. But when he saw Jesus afar off, and that's how you know right there, that his deliverance was on the way. The deliverer, the healer, was on his way to take care of his situation. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. Why did he do that? Why did he run and worship him when he saw him? Because I can tell you one thing. When people show you the truth, Pastor, you will run to that truth when you're looking for it. And this man was looking for the truth and he found it in Jesus. What's the Bible say? That Jesus is the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by him. And this man, even before that passage, he understood that. And he ran and he worshipped Jesus with everything that he had. And in verse number 7 says this, And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you? Now, Son of David, Now, Son of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God that you torment me not. Now, we're hearing from the demons now. I adjure you by God. So, even the devils know who Jesus is. Even the devils fear and tremble. And they cry with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus? In other words, saying, Why did you show up today? We were just kind of doing our own thing, we weren't bothering anybody. Thou son of the most high God. And can I tell you this morning? That society may deny who Jesus Christ is, but the devil's fear and tremble. We may sit around and act like we don't know who Jesus is as a society. We may sit around in the White House and act like we don't know who Christ is and what kind of God we serve. And if it's Jesus, if it's Muhammad, if it's Christian, if it's whoever the case may be. But I can tell you right now, the devils know who the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is. He knows who the real gods are. And the devil's fear and triple themselves. That's how you know we're under demonic oppression in this nation. It's because we're just all confused about everything right now, aren't we? We're in a state of confusion everywhere. And that's a state where the enemy wants us to be. But the devils understand. And he said, I adjure you, thee by God that you torment me not. In other words, he's saying, you know what? I just need a little more time. I just need a little more time. That's what the devil wants with you. Just a little more time. 
And let me tell you this morning, you just hold on. You just hold on in your circumstance right where you're at, and you just keep praying, you just keep fasting, you just keep praying for the deliverance and, and prayer, the prayer of faith in your situation, and God is going to honor your prayers. You say, I've been praying the same prayer, Brother Tim, for years. Keep praying it. Keep believing God for your situation. Who knows how long this man had to pray before God finally showed up in this situation. That's right. And you just hold on. You just hold on and you keep praying. You keep fasting. You keep believing God in your situation. And he's going to show up and take care of your circumstances. Let's look at verse number 8 as we move on here. And he said unto him, he said unto him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. I don't believe he said, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. I believe there was some authority behind it. Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And what do you think happened? When Jesus speaks, let me tell you something, that ain't up for debate. When Jesus starts putting words out there, the devil understands and knows. When Jesus starts speaking, it ain't up for debate. So what happens here? Look at verse number 9. And he asked him, what is your name? Now, when Jesus asks questions in the Bible, is it because he really needs to know the answer? He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. So when you look at the scripture, a lot of times when Jesus is asking the questions, or when God is asking a question to somebody, he wants us to know the full scope of what's happening here. He, we wouldn't know that this man had a legion of devils had Jesus not asked him, what is your name? We would know very little about this passage. So when Jesus asked the question, what is your name? It's not for his knowledge, but it's for our knowledge, right? Yes. So he goes on to say here, and he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are men. Now we said that a legion of Roman centurion soldiers is anywhere between 1,000 and 6,000. So we don't know exactly how many devils this guy had, but we do know this, that he was literally filled up to the brim with devils. And I mean to the top and overflowing. To the point to where he was hanging out in the graveyard, to the point to where he was dealing with all this stuff, to the point to where he was cutting himself, to the point to where he was ready to commit suicide on the brink of giving his life. So we move on here in verse number 10 and it says that he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. <coughs> and he said he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So these devils besought Christ. He said, please don't send us out of here. Why? You asked the question why this morning, right? Why would they say don't send us out of this place? Because they could just go somewhere else, right? Can I tell you that I believe that demonic spirit, uh, spirits are territorial? I believe that demonic spirits are territorial. At one time, independence was the Methlat capital of the nation. And now I think we're ranked somewhere in the top ten, which isn't much better. Sex trafficking. We were talking about that a little bit on Wednesday night. Sex trafficking, you understand, is number one in the city of independence right now across the nation. For young kids anywhere between 12 and 14 years of age to be sex trafficked and go out into sex slavery and all this sort of thing. So understand this morning that spirits are territorial. They want to stay in a group right where they're at and they want that same influence to just keep going out in that area and keep going out in that area. Can I tell you, we got to bind this stuff in the name of Jesus. we got to call upon the name of the Lord and we got to say, you know what, we've had enough of this. we got to start praying. we got to start fasting. If we want to see a move of God and the things broken in our nation, the things broken in our families, the things broken in our city, the things broken in our church, 
if we want to see a move of God because we must understand that the enemy is very territorial in what he wants to do. Why is he territorial? Because he's got a plan. He's crafty. He's cunning. He's the master of deception. Okay? So he is very crafty in what he wants to do. He's very organized in what he wants to do. So he sets up shop and he tries to follow through with it. Amen? So let's look at verse number 11 as we move along. Now there was, there near into the mountains, a great herd of swine feed. Okay? So we know that there's a herd of swine. Verse number 12. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Why? Because they wanted to stay. They didn't want to go. They wanted to stay right where they were at. Okay? Verse number 13 as we move along. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Said it's okay. All right. Go ahead and set up shop where you, where you please. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And they the herd of swine ran violently down the steep hill and placed into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. These pigs committed suicide. You know why I believe Jesus let them go into the swine? Because for one, pigs don't have a soul. But it goes to even show you that, that an animal doesn't even want anything to do with Satan. An animal will try to get out of a circumstance when, when the enemy infiltrated them to where to the point to where they ran down a steep hill into, of all places, into the sea, into a body of water which they don't like to begin with. Right. Right? And they killed themselves. So what do you think happened? These men were upset. Their pigs were all killed, right? Their swine was all drowned, and they're upset. Their Jimmy Dean sausage factory just went right down the hill and drowned themselves right into the sea. And so here's what happened. Let's look at verse number 14. By the way, these 2,000 swine, that was somewhere, if you, if, if you look it up in modern day monies, it would be somewhere around $70,000 worth of swine that just ran themselves down the hill, right? But here's the next thing before I move on. This is exactly what the enemy had in store for this man. The demoniac. The man that was full of the devil. He was literally trying to kill the man. And it's evident by the fact that these pigs couldn't even live with the devil. So they ran down the hill and they killed themselves. They committed suicide. But that's where the enemy wanted this man to be. Take him right to the brink of where he would commit suicide. In verse number 14, the Bible says, And they who fed the swine fled and told it throughout the city and in the country. And when they went out to see then they went out to see what it was that had been done. So they went out. They were mesmerized by the situation. They seen all these floating in the water, all 2,000 of them. And I, I'm sure they, obviously, they didn't have cell phones and all that sort of stuff or Facebook and Twitter, but I guarantee you if they did back then, they'd have been all over Twitter. Oh, yeah. But all over Facebook, them images, the pigs floating around. So they went out into the city, into the country to see what had been done. And they got really, really angry. Really quick. Verse number 15. And they come to Jesus and see who, him who was. Look at that word right there. Past tense. Possessed with the devil. And had, again, past tense. The legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind. What does the Bible say? And they were afraid. 
Now, I'm not a rocket scientist this morning, but I wouldn't have been afraid. I'd have been amazed at what God had done. And God delivered this particular individual. So he's running around. He's full of the devil. He's tearing his clothes off. You couldn't even bring your kids out in public around this guy. It was so crazy. He lived up in a graveyard. He was cutting himself. He was doing all these various things. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene, casts these devils out of him. They go into these pigs, run down a hill, and commit literal suicide. And all of a sudden, the man is set free by the power of God. And for the first time in his life, he was running and gunning and going here and going there. You know how it is when people, have you ever seen people that were just on something? You know, they were on drugs, they were on alcohol, they were on whatever, whatever, whatever. I see them sometimes when we walk around here and I'm praying for them. As I see them walk down the street, they're just going here and they're just going there. And they're just everywhere, just tossed about, tossed about, not knowing what to do, confused as a termite and a yo-yo, moving around everywhere. And all of a sudden, this man, Jesus shows up in his situation, touches him. Heals him, cast the devils out, and now he's sitting. You know why I love that word sitting there? Because for the very first time in his life, he found peace. Because he met the Prince of Peace. Amen. And he was able to sit down and just bask in what God had did. And he was clothed. And he was in his right mind. He wasn't afraid, but they were. And it goes on in verse number 16 and says, And they who saw him then befell to him who was possessed again past tense with the devil and also concerning the, fine, the swine. So they begin to go out to the community and talk about this whole situation. Verse number 17. And they begin to pray him to depart out of their coast. Isn't that amazing? God does something great in somebody's life. You know, when God does something great for you, don't always think that people are going to celebrate with you. When God heals you of something, when God delivers you of something, don't think that people are always just going to celebrate. They'll just turn up their snotty nose a lot of times and be like, well, we just remember how they used to be. Are you amazed how, you know, how much of a photographic memory some people have about your past? Oh, yes. Aren't you just amazed how everybody can just sit and line out, just line by line, precept upon precept, everything that you've done wrong, but they don't know. They can sit and be doing all kind of crazy stuff, but it's all good with them because they're holy. They're holy for the Lord is holy. They showed up to church this morning, so they're holy. So here we are in a situation that these guys asked Jesus to depart out of their coast, right? And here's the principle I want you to get here. Jesus only stays where he's welcome. That's right. He only stays in a heart that's welcome. He only stays in a, in a, in a church that he's welcome in. He only stays in a family that he's welcome in. That's why if nobody else in your family serves God, you keep serving God because he's still welcome there. Yes. And because there's people with situations and circumstances and they're dealing with demonic spirits and things are going on and you're trying to figure it out, you just keep serving God. Because as long as there's one individual that will, that will call upon the name of the Lord, there's still hope in that situation. There's still hope in your family and there's still hope for that deliverance for that individual. But these guys said, you know what? You broke up our business affair. So get out of here, Jesus. And what happens? Verse number 18. And we're bringing this to a landing strip. And when he, Jesus, was coming to the ship, he didn't even, he, you know, he didn't even sweat it. He didn't argue with them. He didn't say, he, he didn't say anything. He just simply, they, they said, depart out of our coast. He just simply says, okay. He just steps right into the ship. 
And he who had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Wouldn't you want to go with him too? Yes, he would. Wouldn't you want to go with him after he delivered you? Your situation? Yes, That's what this man was. He wanted to go with him, but I love verse number 19. Because verse number 19 is the very telltale text of what I want you to really grasp this morning. How be it Jesus suffered him or said unto him, but said unto him, go home to your friends and tell them how great of things that the Lord has done for you and has compassion and had compassion upon you in your situation. Amen. In other words... Basically, what Jesus was saying, you know what? You can come along with me. You can you can come along in our in our little excursions, and we're going to go out. And we're going to preach, and we're going to go out and do this, and, and all this, that, and the other. We're going to go into various cities, but where you're going to be most effective is when you go back home and people see an utter change in your life. Amen. Because people remember who you used to be. Remember that fact. And now they're going to see the new person. Second Corinthians five seventeen is my life verse. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. For old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. Amen. So they see the old, and now they see a brand new creation. And you know what? Sometimes it takes time for people to acknowledge the fact that there has been a change. But let me bet, I'm going to bet your bottom dollar this morning. When you continue to live for Christ, they will have to, at some point, acknowledge there has been a change in your life. So you just keep pressing. You just keep pulling for God. And you can just, you know, because the people, your family, your friends, they know all about your past. My family, there's a lot of them right here right now. They can get up here and talk a lot about them words. But you know how you combat that? How do you combat that? You live the life of Christ. I, I, I often, I've been a manager for several years. Robert and I have both been managers in the same locations and uh, work for guys that, that, you know, for whatever reason, they just like to come back to where we work. That's a good sign, you know. They liked us. They liked the place. And uh, they'd always say, Tim, I remember back when you did this. I'd be like, I don't even remember that. I remember, and, you know, as a manager, sometimes you got to get upset. Uh-huh. They always remember the bad stuff. But I'm like, do you remember any good things about me? <laughs> do you remember anything good that happened, okay? But that is what Jesus was saying. Go back to your friends and tell them how great the things the Lord has done for you. And he has had compassion on you. And I love this part right here in verse number 20 as we close. The Bible said that he departed. He didn't argue with Jesus. He didn't continue fussing with him. He didn't do any of that. He just simply began to publish it right where he was at. And that's in the capitals. I love that. How great of things that Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Why did they marvel? Because of the radical transformation that was in his life. And I love that word that he went out and he published it in the capitals. Because that's where we get our word newspaper. So I can just see this guy running through the streets. Extra, extra, read all about it. Jesus did it for me. He did it for you. And the man became a walking, living newspaper for the glory of God. He published it through his life of what Jesus is capable and able to do of an individual that will totally surrender themselves unto Jesus Christ. It make no difference when you are a Christian. When you do turn your life over to Jesus Christ, there is a radical change in your life. There is a 180 complete turnaround. And so this guy went from Sister Munson being a maniac to a messenger for Jesus Christ. And what I love even more than that is we said he left Capernaum two chapters before this. He left the megaplex of just 
revivals and all these sort of things. People's lives are being changed. And it shows me this, that Jesus will leave the 99 and he will go after the one. And that's what he did in this passage. Isn't that what he did for you? It's called a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And can I tell you this morning, because some of you feel lonely in your spirit. Some of you are the most loneliest individuals on the face of the earth. Can I tell you when I was district youth director, I used to tell people that and be like, Brother Tim, oh, you just got all these friends and you got all these people and you got all this, that, and the other. I said, I can tell you something. It's a very lonely position. As a pastor of this church, I know this man is lonely and we try to stick together as a team to lift each other up and build each other up. And so we find that this man was in a place by himself. And here's my final point. When everybody else, when all your family hear this this morning, because some of you are extremely lonely, when everybody else has walked out on you, Jesus has the ability to walk right in on you. He has the ability to walk right in to your situation and touch you right where you're at. I know what loneliness is at night. I know what it is to cry myself to sleep in dealing with circumstances and situations that you don't want nobody else to know. And some of you feel that loneliness right now in your spirit. And when everybody has walked out, and when you're alone in your own metaphorical graveyard, Jesus has the ability to walk right in and meet you right where you're at. Can we bow our heads this morning? Father, I love you and I thank you. Thank you for the strength to be able to minister this message this morning. God, you changed my message early this morning. I was not going to preach on this passage of Scripture. But God, I believe... That somebody in this place this morning needed to hear the word of the Lord. He will leave the 99 and he will come after one soul that is in need, that is in desperation, that has cried out unto him. He hears your cries this morning. He has heard your prayers. He knows your thoughts. He knows your struggles today. And he's here to meet your needs. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. You say, Brother Tim, I'm lonely this morning. I just need some prayer. I feel like everything and everybody's abandoned me. I feel like I'm on my own island somewhere unto myself.